Okay, uh, Fender, Squire, uh, Gibson, Epiphone, uh, Cadillac, Chevy, um, Audi, Scora, uh, Bruce Willis, Rock Johnson. There's plenty of these kind of things where things come from the same factory, from the same company, but they have a different brand and they have slightly different target audience. Say you build a product and it costs you say $100 to make the product. And then you do your research and calculations and you say that I'm going to sell this product. The, the retail price of this product is going to be $250. That should give enough margin for the marketing costs, distribution costs and all those and still give you a decent profit. You sell the product, later realize that people are willing to pay more for your product, say all the way up to 400, but now you are selling it 250. So then you crank up the price to 400 and you are still making a good business because now you may sell less of your product, you know, less units, but since you get a bigger margin, your profits are bigger. But then later you realize that now you lose a big portion of that market because there are people who would be willing to spend that 250 but will never spend 400 You sort of lose this lower end of a market because you don't have product to meet the more cost-conscious customer needs. So one strategy then that a lot of companies have used is to create another brand. Another brand that they can sell cheaper it is often that the higher end product is almost equal to the lower end product but the different brand allows you to sort of market them through different channel and give an impression of a higher end product and that brand and then the lower end product so they don't compete and you can still charge 400 from those people who are willing to pay and then you can grab those customers who are not willing to pay that much and still do profitable business. You can maximize your market reach and you can still specialize into different market segments with the brand suitable for that segment. Clever, huh? And the purpose of this all is to take all your money. So a good example of this strategy is a Rolleiflex and then a Rolle cord. Now Rolleiflex is the top of the line, more expensive, more prestige brand, whereas Rolex Core is sort of a little bit more low end, and Rolex has been able to sell this much cheaper than this one. So I thought it might be interesting to do a little bit comparison between Rolex Flex and Rolex Core. Built in same factories by the same company, under a different brand, and targeted more to professionals and consumers. So let's take a look. As there are many different models within the Rolleiflex range as well as under the brand of Rolleic Core, uh, let's concentrate on these two specific cameras. They are both mine and I have shot hundreds of rolls with them and they kind of are top of the line for both these brands. This is a 2.8 F and this is a Rolex Cord VB. I did earlier a comparison between a Rolleiflex and a Hasselblad and then I used a simple spreadsheet uh, to bring out the differences and talk about the different aspects. So I thought I'm gonna use the same spreadsheet this time. And so with both of these cameras we will look at the versatility, build quality, usability, cost and image quality. And then we compare which one is which one. So let's start with the versatility. Now they look pretty much the same and they are both similar basic construction. You cannot change the lens, there's no automation, it's all manual. For Rolleco there's a little bit better availability for add-ons such as filters. Uh, but it is just because my Rolleiflex Flex is a 2.8, so-called Pioneer 3, and uh, all the add-ons here are a little bit more rare and more expensive. So 
So for these cameras, they are not really most versatile cameras. They are pretty much what they are. So when I was comparing Hasselblad and Rolleiflex, Flex, I gave uh, Rolleiflex Flex uh, a 2 for versatility compared to Hasselblad giving 8. So here I would give this a 2 and then I would give Rolle Core a 3 just because of a little bit better availability of those add-ons. Then let's talk about the build quality. There's a tiny difference in build quality. This is a little bit heavier and a little bit bulkier. And you can sort of feel that even though your Rolle Core is also beautifully built, really nice workmanship. A good example where you can see differences are, for example, the bottom latch here. This is made of uh, thick metal, whereas in the Rolle Core, it is not as thick. It works the same, but it's a little bit thinner. Um, but even this is a solid metal construction, there's a little bit more decoration in the bottom and, and all that. So from the build quality point of view, I don't think there really is any difference. But hey, Rolay says that in building the Rolay code they used slightly cheaper materials. And um, so let's believe them and agree that somewhere they cut corners a little bit. Not to the extent that this would be of poor quality, not by any means. But let's give from the build quality a Rolle Flex a full 10 and let's give a Rolle Core an 8. I mean, you can sort of feel a bit difference with the smoothness. But it may well be it's just these particular units that have a slightly different feel. I don't know. So then let's talk about the usability. These are both manual cameras, very similar to use. You need to learn to look from, from the viewfinder like this. Uh, you adjust the distance in the same way. So they are very similar cameras in terms of using them, taking the pictures and all that. Also, all those add-ons and whatnot, they have the same feeling. They are not that different. My Rolleiflex has a light meter. It's not very reliable and it actually adds a nasty bulk onto the side of my camera. So that is the different slightly lighter, slightly smaller, bulkier, heavier. Then one difference in usability is how you load the film. Uh, it's maybe not the biggest difference, but let's take a look at the Rolle Flex first. So you open the bottom latch here, then you take a film, put it in. Then you need to push your film under this roll, like this. Take it to the upper spool. And then how you advance this, you need to open the crank and get the upper spool into the right position. I find that really awkward to work with the crank while loading the film. You put it up there, you tighten it, then you close the lid. No need to pay attention to how far you took the film. And then you just start to crank it. The Rolleiflex notices the thickness of the film. So when the packing paper is combined with the film, it gets a little bit thicker. And Rolleiflex notices that tiny difference in the thickness and knows when the film starts. So that happens automatically. And then you just rotate as long as it goes. It stops, crank back, and now it's ready to shoot. Rolleiflex advertised this to be an improvement that you don't need to look at the start of the film, but your camera detects that automatically. That is okay as long as your camera is in the right specs and it really notices the difference and then your film is not of an odd type that is too thick or too thin. But it actually works. I've never had really problems with this automatic film detection. So 
I guess it works as Rolay intended. Then let's take a look at the Rolay code, how you uh, get your film into a Rolay code. In the very same way you open uh, the back of the camera and in the very same way you put your film into, into the camera like this. But unlike in a roller flex, you don't need to squeeze this film under any kind of a roller or anything. You just take it up here and then find the right spot from the upper reel. Now I find using this kind of a crank or this kind of a lever much easier when loading the film. You don't need to rotate the big crank, but you can actually adjust the upper spool into the right position in the very same way you put the film in there and you start to rotate. Now there is no automatic measures to know when the film starts so here you need to pay a little bit attention and you just push the film forward as long as you see an arrow and there is a red dot and you align the arrow with the dot. Then you close the lid And then you rotate this as long as it goes. Like this. And now your camera is ready to be used. So my personal opinion is that I like the way Rolex Core does it much better. So for example, if you are out in the freezing cold and you need to change your film, um, you don't need to squeeze it under any kind of tiny spools or, or anything like that with the Rolex cord. And also you don't need to work with this handle while you know, putting the film in. The only thing you need to pay attention is to align this little dot with an arrow. And I mean, if you are taking photographs, you are not probably blind, so that shouldn't be that difficult, really. Much more prefer the simpler construction of a Rolex cord. So then your camera is ready to be used. So how do you use them? Uh, with the Rolex flex, basically you adjust it like this, and you use these two rollers to set the aperture and set the timing. And you can see them both on top of the camera. So you can pretty much keep it here and see all the relevant information from there. This is pretty, pretty easy and handy. And then you take the picture by pressing this button here with your right hand. So you adjust your left hand and you take the picture with your right hand. Fairly simple. Um, what I like about the Rolex Flex is that you can see the numbers on top of you a bit more easier and a lot of people like this shutter right-handed shutter um, also advancing the film cocks the shutter so you don't need to cock the shutter separately with the Rolex cord you do it slightly differently advancing the film won't cock the shutter you need to do it separately by pulling this lever and then you adjust and you do the setting of the time and aperture with these little things at the side here. It's not much more complicating than with the Rolex Flex. It is just a slightly different implementation. And then you take the picture with your left hand. You keep your camera like this and you take your left index finger and you take the picture from here. That is slightly different and some people don't like the shutter and how it works. But I actually like this a lot. You can hold your camera with your right hand really steady and use your left hand to take the pitch. So I don't know, there are some differences but not really that much. I kind of like the Rolex cord a little bit more but it's maybe just my personal way of holding the camera with the right hand and then releasing the shutter with my left hand. You can take multiple exposures with these both cameras. With the Rolex cord you just uh, move this little thingy here down so now it allows you to take many exposures on one frame and with the Rolex flex uh, there's a little thing here next to the crank that you just move before 
you uh, you advance the film so it, it doesn't actually advance the film it just uh, cuts the shutter so from the usability point of view you probably already know that I'm a big fan of TLR cameras and I think that these are both the top of the line examples of that era of camera making that style of the camera making and I probably love to shoot TLR more than any other camera so I give them full tens both of them slightly different but worth of a full ten so then let's talk about the cost uh, that is the big difference. I mean, this top-of-the-line Rolleiflex would cost you 1500 and this top-of-the-line Rolleicord you shouldn't pay more than maybe 400 And then if you go to the lower models in both of these brands, the difference stays the same. Rolleiflex is always significantly more expensive than a Rolleicord to the extent that it's hard to justify. Also, if you have a 2.8 Rolleiflex, then all the add-ons, such as the filters, are more expensive. You should be prepared to pay at least double the price. So from the cost point of view, I think Rolleiflexes, especially these top-of-the-line Rolleiflexes, they are already a bit too expensive, so I give it only three. Uh, you can get a good Rolleic cord with a reasonable price. I would say, taking into account the quality and all the aspects, an eight. It is not a cheap camera, but it's well worth the money. So then last but not least, of course, the image quality. I mean, as I said to you earlier, there are multiple different models in the flex line and in a cord line. But if we stick to these two models, uh, there are a little bit different lens settings here. Uh, this is a 2.8 planar, and it is considered to be the best lens that Rolleiflex has ever came out with. This is a 3.5 Xenar. Um, and people say that it is not as good as this one. I mean, of course, there's a half a step difference in the speed, but honestly, there really is no difference that I could see. All other aspects of my photography has so much more impact on the final picture than the difference between these lenses. Also, if you read online, some people like this one a little bit more than this one and all that. Okay, let's give them some points then in terms of the image quality. Uh, Rolleiflex is almost perfect. Let's give it a 9. And then Rolleicord. Even though I said that I don't see any difference, there may be some tiny little difference because, I mean, on a paper, uh, this lens is better and it's a half a step faster and all that. So let me give this one an 8. 9 and 8. So now even before we look at the spreadsheet, just my impression is that there is something really cool about this 2.8F Rolleiflex. Uh, you can be sure that it is a top-notch thing, that it really gives you marvelous pictures and it never fails. But then it's heavier than my Rolleic cord. It is more expensive, so I need to be more careful with it. If I want to buy filters, they are much more expensive. Uh, so I'm torn. I'm really torn. It's going to be interesting to take a look at the final results. So what are they? Wow. Rolleic cord wins. Two points. Three points, if I really count it accurately. 34, 37. That is interesting. And the biggest difference is, of course, the cost. But this can't be true. I mean, there's no way a cheaper brand should win. So we need to do something about it. Hold on a second. Let's add here an element of... So as we can see from the final uh, calculations, the Rolleiflex won by one point. 
um, out of these two it is a better camera. Hey, there's a funny story. Some companies go even further than these two to differentiate same products with a different brand. Uh, years ago, I was uh, in the process of purchasing a new car and I went to the dealership. It was a Dutch dealership. Uh, and then uh, they had an, a new car, really with a discount price. And they really wanted to sell it to me with that huge discount because it had came out from the products online so that the left hand side of the car was Dutch. It has all the Dutch patches and it had all the Dutch emblems and whatnot and at the right hand side it has all the Chrysler stuff. So the left hand side was uh, uh, Dutch Sebring and the right hand side was a Chrysler uh, Cirrus, I guess. You know, that was a good example of batch engineering going wrong. Uh, this is not what these cameras are. These are genuinely different cameras, but built probably in the same factories, under the same company, just to be able to target different markets. <laughs> 